Hi, everybody. Uh, Matt already gave me a very kind introduction, but I'll give you a few more fun facts about myself. It's a tripping hazard for a guy like me. This is going to go over here. A um, few other fun facts about myself. I live here, and I see a lot of familiar faces. It's great to see you again. It has been too long since I have been behind the lectern of DJUG. Uh, but I do live a half an hour away in uh, Littleton, and it's always good to play the home game. So thanks for inviting me. I work for a company called Confluent. Confluent makes a streaming data or an event streaming platform based on Apache Kafka. We make a hosted cloud service that's based on Apache Kafka and has other goodies in it. So that's what we do, and that's kind of what this talk, this talk's about some Kafka-related things tonight. Uh, what do I do there? I run the developer relations team. So uh, we've got a team of developer advocates. We've got a group that runs meetups. There's like 180 Kafka meetups worldwide. We keep them busy all year long. Um, documentation, all kinds of stuff. Content, blogs, videos. We make things. Uh, the idea is to make it easy and fun for you to learn how to do stuff with Kafka. Is there anybody here who is currently using Kafka in your development life? Hands. That's a lot. That's a lot. Uh, anybody who feels like very new to it and interested in learning the basics? Some of the hands were the same. That's good. Uh, that's, that means you are highly motivated to learn. Um, and everybody else, I'll assume you're somewhere in between. What this talk is, uh, is there, there is really an embedded introduction to Kafka as a platform in the middle. So if you're new to Kafka, don't worry. You're going to learn what it's all about. If you already know Kafka pretty well, I'll tell jokes. And there will be probably a few other things that you didn't know. Because Kafka is, is becoming a big and complex ecosystem. So there's probably some things in there that you just don't know about. And you'll get to learn what they are. If you already know all the Kafka things, what I'm, the argument I'm trying to make tonight is this, that we can realize ACID transactional semantics at scale by building systems on top of Kafka, by building them in a particular way. Um, sometimes people ask this provocative question, is Kafka a database? And it's kind of the question that this talk is, is asking. And I don't want to give you the answer yet. Uh, it, seems, it seems like I'm going to give the answer that yes, it is. I don't know if I am. We'll find out. And as always, you should ask questions if you have them. Um, do we have a time that we really should be out of here by, Matt? Nope. Awesome. Ask as many questions as you want. Uh, the bathroom is over there, but like we said, you'll get locked out if you go, so careful. Uh, Anyway, let's go. The, the, the basic uh, theme and argument and, and idea of this talk comes from this guy. His name is Martin Kleppman. He's a researcher at the University of Cambridge, a uh, distributed systems researcher. He writes a lot about streaming and a lot about Kafka. And I have slowly found out over time that all of the good ideas that I have about streaming actually come from Martin. Like if you just build the graph of where the idea came from, all of these edges lead back to Kleppman. So he's a smart guy. He's a, a, a guy to follow in this space if you care about it. Um, his book is of note. That QR code gets you there. So uh, since I stole his idea, my agreement with him was that I would at very least plug his book. It seems only fair. Anyway, let's ask some questions. Like, what's the database? Now, mm, that's not going to be a problem for anybody, is it? Uh, it is. The projector's not having it. That's amazing. I don't. I don't know how to do that. I'm. You know. I'm gonna just just soak that in for a minute. Anyway, when you ask questions like this, this isn't the the horrible thing that. Sometimes a speaker will do where you'll say, you know, you'll begin a talk with Webster's Dictionary says. That's a terrible, terrible speaking anti-pattern. Don't ever do it. But um, this is where I'm going is, is, you know, here's this thing. Everybody kind of knows what it is. Uh, we're comfortable with databases. But when you actually try to come up with the set of necessary and sufficient conditions that describe 
you know, that include all things that are databases and exclude all things that aren't databases. It's hard. It's like the undergraduate philosophy class question where you ask, what's a chair? Everybody knows what a chair is. I'm not stupid, you know, but you actually try to define chairs and that's very hard to do. This is kind of like that. Um, so let me just play with the definition a little bit. Um, let's say minimally a, a database is a program that remembers things. Well, there are other kinds of programs that remember things like file systems and things like that, that we don't usually call databases. So that doesn't seem satisfactory. Uh, you, you think of a database as having some kind of data model. Um, there are, most databases are relational databases, but they aren't all. There are other kinds of databases. So maybe it's a program that remembers things and has some kind of data model, right? Um, I would like to be artificially restrictive here. Um, I, I asked that provocative question, is Kafka a database? Uh, not really sure yet what the answer is. We'll come up with that. But I, I want to say, to, to artificially restrict the universe of discourse here and give seizures, um, <laughs> uh, which is actually, that's probably too slow and for some people not a joke. But um, anyway, we'll be all right. Uh, a database is a program that remembers things and has acid transactional semantics. Now, that's not true. There are things that are databases that, that don't have acid semantics, and we'd all agree that they're databases. But just play with me here tonight, and let's... Let's make it extra difficult here. So this requires us to ask the next question, which is, um, is there anybody we can ask? You, okay, let's, uh, let's do that. Maybe there's more to it. go. There's my family. They're super cool. Still doing it. Le yeah. yeah. Um, let's experiment here. Okay. Try taking this out of the equation. Because it does show up fine on there. Better. Regretfully. Okay. Dang it. Sorry. It's okay. All right. Now we know what the problem is, all right? We do. Um, and I want my adapter back. Yes. That's a slippery slope. You know how I many I've lost of these? You're a guy like me. I'll just go. <laughs> I'm, not com I'm not coming to beer. If I have your adapter, I'm not coming to beer, so I'm just going to disappear. I'll right. be like, oh, yeah, I'll see you at the bar. <laughs> Free adapter. All right. I have this idea that I want to do at a conference, and I help organize a conference, the Kafka Summit. I think I want to try this at Kafka Summit sometime. I want to do distributed systems family feud. And this would be a great thing. Like, what does ACID stand for? I think most of us would get that right. Most of us know what the, the letters stand for. But it might be a little bit interesting. And then if you got into, like, definitions of A, C, I, and D, that would probably turn into an interesting game. So I need to figure out how to make this work. I love the idea, but for tonight, let's just walk through uh, what these things mean briefly. I want to, I wanna, uh, in defining these, I want to set up the problem. And I don't want to talk about ACID with respect to a database that runs on a single machine where there's a single thread that the, the thread can take a lock and modify memory and do all those boring things like you're this omnipotent controller of the whole world. I want to talk about this in terms of the garden variety distributed systems that it is sort of common for us to build these days. Even if you are not AWS building the cloud, as Fred says, if you're just a, a, a regular Java developer building business systems, these days we are all distributed systems developers. So I want to talk about these in terms of those common distributed systems problems. And I don't want to talk about them in order. I'm going to go out of order because I like to. So durability. Durability is pretty simple, but the, the interesting thing about durability is that it is a moving target. I think it's a moving target. When I was a little boy learning basic and 8086 assembly language on a non-IBM compatible DOS machine, 1984, great time, um, the, the databases that, that ran the world, you know, 
Durability back then meant that the commit log would get written to tape, right? That was durability. We'd, we'd spool off that commit log to tape. We could play the tape back later and have stuff back in memory. That was durability. So most of us, when we've come of age, uh, we think of durability automatically as one of these. We think of the metal disk. It's got the thin layer of rust deposited on it, and it spins real fast, and we write the, the data to that. And that's what durability means. Uh, and that's fair, right? That's not, that's not what somebody in 1980 would have said, uh, but it's what we see now. Um, really, though, I think more and more these days, this is moving to, to be that if you have a data some kind of data storage system. It's probably distributed. We probably need to do some kind of replication, right? For there to be a, a credible durability story, I, I probably want the thing to manage replication for me so I can lose parts of the, the cluster and everything's OK. So just, I mean, that's not a terribly profound point, but it is kind of neat to see how that target has moved. Broadly, though, durability just means we write stuff to non-volatile storage. We can get it back later. It's a hard problem, but it's not really going to be a hard problem for us. Atomicity. Now, the, the classical way this gets introduced in a computer science textbook is we say, well, we're trying to transfer money. And we need multiple writes to happen either all together or not at all. And I always love the fact that we use uh, a financial example for atomicity when like the real systems, I've never worked in fintech, but I certainly have talked to many people who have or who do. Real fintech systems are like the least transactional things in the world and always have been. But this is the, the story we tell ourselves to illustrate atomicity. We have some kind of transactional context that we begin, and then we issue multiple rights. Here we give $100 to Tim, and then we take $100 from Gwen, and we need both of those to happen or not happen. We can't have the, the give $100 to me happen without the debit from Gwen because then we've created money. And only central banks get to do that. Uh, our software can't. So um, that's, that's what atomicity means in the, the sort of traditional database -y sense. I want to propose another uh, thing. This is also an atomicity problem uh, in terms of, again, the garden variety distributed systems that we all build. You have some program. And that program, what it does is it processes events. Big surprise that the Kafka guy would describe software in those terms. But it's kind of true. Right? Events impinge on our programs, and we do some computation, and we produce a result. What do you do with that result? Well, let's say you want to store it in a database. And I'm not going to argue with you. That's fine. You should write that result in a database. That's a great thing to do. But you also have this recommendation engine, so you write it into that. That's a graph data model. It's a different thing. It's optimized for that. You don't want to try to do it in the relational database, so you write it to that separate thing. Also, we have to do search. So we write it into three separate elastic indexes for three separate kinds of searches that we do, and there you go. So now, all of a sudden, you have taken on a bunch of responsibility as an application to manage atomicity, uh, to, to, to make sure that those writes all happen or don't happen. Because what happens if one of those things goes away, and you've done the relational database write, you've done the graph database write, and you go to write to the search cluster, do you have to then put that write somewhere off to the side so you can play it back later? Do you have to go back to the database and the graph model and compensate those writes out of existence? That's a lot of work. You're just trying to write an application, and suddenly you've inherited this sort of distributed, almost distributed transaction functionality, which is not your job, probably. Your job is probably to write features that deliver value to some kind of user. So that's a, a problem that we have to fix. That's, that's the atomicity problem I want to solve. And I'm just giving you problems right now, by the way. No solutions yet. You have to wait until probably like 7.30 for your life to get better. <laughs> My job is to convince you that your life is terrible. Uh, and it'll get better by the time we go. All right, isolation. Let me set up sort of a straw man isolation problem. Like nobody would ever do this. You'd never build this system. But I want to illustrate uh, the 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 sense in which I, I mean the term isolation. So we have a, a database in the middle, and that is a conventional mutable update in place data store. So there are some kind of keys, primary keys, and those refer to some location. And we can change the value at that location, just like your friendly neighborhood relational database is. Uh, could be a key value store. It doesn't need to be a relational database. But what we mean intuitively when we say database, that's what that thing is. 
And there are multiple processes out there that would like to change it. So those processes are probably instances of a, of a clustered application. Uh, you can think of them, though, as you know, me on my mobile device. Or uh, maybe that's process one, is me on my mobile device. Process two is somebody in a browser. And we're trying to, we're trying to change the same thing in the database. Say that we're trying to create a user account. So process one is going to say, hey, is there an account for Tim? We'll check in the mutable update in place data store. And it'll say, no, there's not. And the process two is also trying to create a Tim because you have two people racing to create the Tim user account. And um, so the first process will go on and make that Tim. The second process will go on and make a Tim. And that's bad, right? We don't want that to happen. That's a bad thing. There can be only one Tim. He's like the Highlander. So um, that illustrates the, uh, the isolation problem. What we want is for all of those distributed mutation requests, those attempts to read and write, uh, we want them to behave as if they are happening in a single thread in uh, a single negotiated order. So we're going to figure out what order they happened in and play them back like there's just one thread, even though there's not just not one thread, but there's not one computer, right? There are multiple computers with their own unsynchronized clocks. It's way worse than multiple threads. What we need, though, is for those writes and reads to look like they're happening in order in one thread. That's the problem. That's the isolation problem. We don't have that. Consistency. Um, consistency, it, when, you, when I read the, the definitions of acid consistency, all right, there's cap consistency, you know, consistency, availability, partition tolerance. Not that. This is the same word, and it means something different. So uh, it's not a good thing. Not only does it mean something different, but in the context of a single database, like here is this relation, here's Postgres, and it has ACID transactions. The, the definitions of consistency with respect to a single database are often a little strange. It seems like they just wanted a C in there. They didn't want to say aid. They wanted to say ACID. And so we had to come up with a way of getting shoehorning C into the acronym. System-wide, though, this is interesting. Uh, and this is, I think, I want to think of this less as a property of the data store and more as a property of the system that we're building. By the way, that's an important transition. There's some data storage infrastructure, and it's critically important. And then there's the system as a whole. And what we're really talking about here is these properties in the system, not these properties in Kafka or in some database, but the system having ACID properties. And in that sense, consistency means that system-wide, there are some invariants that we are enforcing. There are constraints, like there can be only one of each username. And account balances are always positive. Or whatever the, concern, whatever the, the invariants are, we get to define them, and our system maintains them. So uh, this will end up shaking out of, in, at least in my examples, shaking out of our isolation solution. Uh, not, sorry, not to give you the idea that there are any solutions. I'm supposed to be convincing you that your life is terribly broken, and there's no way you can build a system that does any of this. But you've seen this movie before. So anyway, uh, this, is, this is cool. Uh, we see the problems. We need atomicity, consistency, isolation, durability. Let's, um, or durability, atomicity, isolation, consistency in my order. Let's take a break from that set of problems for now, though, and come back to the question of Kafka, since this is allegedly a Kafka talk. There's a Kafka logo on my shirt. By the way, make sure you get me to explain this shirt. I usually forget by the end. But I'll find some time to explain it. I just I don't want to yet. But anyway, I would like to give you a little bit of an introduction to Kafka, um, enough to solve the problems that I just laid out, and to give you an appreciation for Kafka as an ecosystem, not Kafka as a really scalable pipe or a message queue on steroids. Those are, those are sort of old-fashioned accounts of what Kafka is. Uh, it's a rich uh, ecosystem these days, and I, I sort of want to give you that picture. And I need to get all that stuff on the table so that I can solve these acid problems. And the solutions end up falling out pretty nicely. So let's talk about Kafka. Kafka is a system for managing events. Um, Kafka is a distributed log. We could call it a distributed log. Um, Sometimes people call Kafka a queue. 
And I've said before, I think if, if you hear anyone call Kafka a, a Q, you have my permission to correct them gently, uh, be nice about it, but it's not really a Q. I think that's at least an imprecise way to describe it, and, and you'll see why. However, like legacy enterprise message queues, Kafka has these things called topics. And topics are the fundamental unit of organization of data in, uh, in Kafka. Uh, Kafka is a system for managing events. These events are modeled in Kafka as key value pairs. So a Kafka, an event in Kafka or a message in Kafka is a key and a value, right? When you get one of these keys and values, you put it in a topic. That's what Kafka does. And you just put them in the topic one after another. And if that topic is just a single partition like this, just one big giant log, those things stay in order. They're, they're persistent. Kafka will, is, is writing them to disk, and they will stay on disk until you tell them to go away. So by default, that's seven days. They'll stay in the log for seven days. You can turn that knob to infinity days if you want. You can turn it to an hour. You know, there's lots of, there's, there's lots of uh, uh, the retention policy is a, is a dial that you can set. You have options there. I'm going to record your Oh, nice. Thank you. I thought that was for a dolly shot, and I was about to be super happy about that. We need to work on that for next time. I can bring my gimbal and kind of get, get like some kind of, you know. Um, also, and Matt, feel free to screw around with it. I'm, it's, I'm totally cool, so don't, don't stop. Please. Um, one or many of... Oh, okay. So the so each message has one key and one value, okay. and you can have many different keys that go in one topic. In fact, that becomes very important next. So so hold on to the thought of one and many. Uh, we're going to have many keys, and we're going to have to think about those keys uh, a lot. All right. So yeah, these things get written to this topic. Yes. Um, was, was the question whether keys have to be unique? Okay. They don't, have to, they don't have to be unique within the topic at all. So it's not like a key value store database where writing the same key overwrites the previous one. Um, by, by in, in a normal Kafka topic, keys don't have to be unique and are really probably not unique. It's likely that you're seeing the same key more than once. There are some kinds of Kafka topics where Keys are effectively unique. Maybe we'll talk about that later, but um, they're not unique within the topic. They're just, they're just, um, they're just keys. Um, what is unique is an offset. So once I produce a message to this topic, it gets an offset, a uh, numeric offset. Those start at zero, and they go up by one. And you got 64 bits worth of them. So by all means, please try to overflow that. But yeah, it's. That's not, that's not practical storage-wise, right? But um, there is a unique numeric offset that identifies uh, messages in a topic, but the key is not unique. OK, so a, lo a, a topic is fundamentally a log. I want you to think of it as a log. It's a record of things in order. And those things, just like we know from application log files, you, don't, you, you put new things on the end, but you don't go back and change things. Right, if you're editing an application log file, what are you? A criminal or, or a conspirator, which is the same thing. That's also a crime. So you're probably covering something up. You don't change application log files. You add stuff on the end. And maybe you segment it and you throw away old parts and everything. That's fine. But the messages are immutable. You append them to the end of the topic and you don't change them once they're there. That's important. That's just like events in real life, right? Things happen, you don't get to go back and change them. You don't get to unsay those words years ago you wish you'd said. You know, Uncle Rico didn't get put in the game, and he wanted to go back in time and get put in the game again. This didn't happen. He can't change that event. All right. So inside this topic, if there's no partitioning, if it's just this one piece, we're guaranteed these things are in order, and that order is not going to change. Um, it's very fast and very predictable to write and read to one of these because we're always appending to the end of a file or seeking to a single offset. 
in a relational database, the contract the relational database makes with you is that reads might be these really fancy things where there's lots of work and computation and many indexes being consulted and pages read and all. The, who knows what might be going on? So you could issue a read to a relational database that takes a long time, right? Now, database is doing a lot of work for you, so it's not, it's not like it's a bad deal. It's just that that read distribution of read times is, is huge. In Kafka, it's not. It's very, very small. Um, the downside of that is, remember, it's a log. And logs are not very exciting to read. You can scan them. That's it. So we're going to have to do something to fix that problem. This is clearly uh, infrastructure. This is a very, very low layer of things. And to keep our life, to keep it useful, we're going to have to add layers on top of it. All right. Also, these are persistent on disk. I can't say that often enough. Uh, Kafka storage is not ephemeral. Uh, you can have it remember things for as long as you like. As long as you can afford. OK, it's scalable, though. It, it came of age um, in the days of Hadoop. And we used to call it, we used to use the word big data in reference to Kafka. Really, nobody says that anymore, at least with, re with respect to Kafka. But it is a scalable system. It is a distributed piece of distributed data infrastructure. Uh, so what that means is these topics, we can split them into pieces. And those pieces are individual separate log files, or groups of log files, and they can be stored I have to sneeze. This is killing me. Let's see if I can mute. All right. Um, I got to the mute button in time. That was great. Anyway, these can be stored on separate machines. We call those machines brokers, separate nodes in this cluster. So this gives us the ability to scale if there's a lot of writing going on or a lot of reading or we want to store data for a long time, whatever. You know, we've, we've got this mechanism for scaling now by breaking a topic up into partitions. But if you want to write to this, like how do you know where one of these key value pairs goes? And here's where you see why there's a key. Because what we do is we run that key through a hash function. And uh, the output of that hash function mod, the number of partitions, tells us where we go. That means the same key always gets written to the same partition. So globally, I don't know what order my messages are in. If I partition, I have lost global ordering forever. It's gone. Forget it. But within a, a given key, I know I have this, this strict ordering guarantee remains. So the same key, messages of the same key, are always in order. Uh, that means that I have to think about that key. That means that maybe uh, I have a topic where I'm producing readings from my global network of house thermostats or something, and each one has a unique ID. And so I produce them with that unique ID. That way I know I'll always get readings from the same thermostat in order. Um, I might also have some sort of region, and I want events from a region in order. That means that I'll have to, I'll have to produce them to one topic with one key, and then consume from that topic and produce to another topic with a different key. So you can, you can have two topics with the same stuff. Question back there. What's that? Ah, this question is, how, do you know, how does a consumer group know this? I don't yet know what a consumer group is. So let's wait. Where there's a slide for that, and we will absolutely talk about that. So is the offset per partition? Yes, offset is per partition. Excellent question. Has to be, right? Uh, so you have topic. Partition offset that uniquely identifies a message. As a developer, you think about topics. You think about partitions enough to know how to size things. But then in, at the API level, when you're actually writing code, you don't ever really touch partitions. Um, you think about the topic. And you know there's partitioning happening. And you're able to not worry about that. Kafka, if you're a Kafka broker, like at the broker level, it's kind of funny because brokers really manage partitions. Topics are this little lightweight patina of metadata that go on top of partitions. And the work that brokers do is they're, like, they're busy managing these logs and replicating them and doing all this stuff. And that's kind of all partition maintenance. You, as a developer, you think about topics. That's the data model. Uh, all right, so partitioning lets us scale. Uh, ordering is within partition only. If you have a partition topic, you don't have global ordering. You have ordering by key. Every once in a while, that's a bummer. 
but you would be surprised if you are new to this, it matters less than you'd think. Like ordering within key, it turns out is pretty much always what you want. So this is, this is much less of a limitation than it would seem. But it does mean that one of my primary data modeling concerns is picking a key. And that thing I said a minute ago, where maybe you need two keys, you need two sets of ordering semantics, and so you, you denormalize. Uh, somebody tell me why that's perfectly OK. Because normally it's bad, right? If you have data in one table and you copy it to another table, you change it in this table, you have to go change it in that table. We don't like to denormalize. We like normalized schemas because that keeps things, keeps, gives us integrity, data integrity, right? It's OK in Kafka because, like I said, events are forever. They're immutable. So if you need to denorm denormalize them, it's fine. I mean, you have to pay for the storage. You have to pay for moving the, the compute of moving the data around and all that stuff. It's not, it's not massless. But in terms of data integrity, denormalizing is not a risk because it's immutable data. And that's one of the, there, there are a few, um, few facts about Kafka that end up with very wide ranging implications in the kinds of things we can get away with in the systems we build on top of them. And the fact that Kafka events are immutable is the first one of those. It's huge and important. All right, oh, there goes our partition. Now let's talk about replication briefly. Uh, if these were, if I had a topic and it was split into four partitions, you see I've got four brokers, that's nice and neat. Each one of those partitions lives on one machine. This is great. Now in reality, uh, a broker probably has hundreds or thousands of partitions on it. Just depends on the system. So a, a given machine can manage many, many, many partitions. That's what a, a Kafka broker does. But let's keep it simple here. This would be no fun, because if I lost a broker, I'd lose its data. And we just wouldn't accept that. So uh, what Kafka does is it, it replicates, and um, it, it elects one of those replicas as the leader. And when an application is writing, it'll always write to the leader. So the, act, the connection from the client to the broker, if you're writing to partition three, is to broker three. And you write to that partition. And the other, and then and that set of replicas, it manages the replication. The client doesn't have to worry about that. Make sense? That's a, a that's so. There's this whole big consistency discussion that that you have to work through, I, and we won't tonight because that's a way deeper dive into producing than than we need to get into. But um, that discussion is made easier by the fact that you always write and read to the master, to the leader. And when one goes away, the cluster elects a new one of the remaining functional in sync up to date replicas that automatically gets elected. All right, how do we write into Kafka? Well, um, you write a program. You write a client program. Uh, the, the program that writes into a topic is called a producer. And uh, the producer uses, if it's, if it's Java, it, there's a Maven dependency that you put in your build file. And it's a pretty simple library that you use. You give it a little bit of configuration to tell it where your cluster is, maybe some security configs, and a few other things that, you, that maybe you want to tweak, maybe you don't. And there's a couple classes that you need to play with in the API to connect to the cluster, uh, make a new record to produce, and then send it to the cluster. And that library handles the plumbing for you, connection pooling, retries, waiting for an acknowledgment, buffering, all that stuff that would not be super valuable for you to write. That's what that library does. Uh, it does more than that. Actually, the producer it has become a fairly interesting thing of late uh, in the last couple of years. But you can just think of it as the library that lets you write into a topic. And that's what a producer is. It's your code that puts messages into topics. Uh, this being a jug, I'm happy to report that Java is the native language of Kafka. So the, the, the language library that ships with Kafka is, uh, is Java. It used to be Scala a long time ago. It's not anymore. Uh, you can still get a Scala driver. But all of the other JVM languages, they all, have, they all have libraries, but they wrap the native Java one, which is, that's, I mean, that's the non-insane thing to do. <laughs> you don't want to rewrite that. However, the wire protocol is all public and documented and everything. So there is a, an open source C library called librd Kafka. 
It's funny, people say it quickly, and it sounds like they're saying liberty, liberty, Kafka. Um, and the guy who wrote it is Swedish, so he doesn't think of the guy with the flute and the drum and the funny hat like we do when we say that. But um, anyway, liberty, Kafka is the foundation for all of the uh, non-JVM libraries. I shouldn't say all. The vast majority of the non-JVM libraries are based on that C library. And Go, .NET, C, Python, those are all supported. You can get those as a supported form from my employer, yeah. Do they have feature parity with Java library? Do they have feature parity with Java library? No, is the answer. No, they do not. Importantly, the Java library for the last two years has had a feature called exactly once semantics. And that's, that happens in the, well, there's stuff in the broker for it, but um, substantially a client proposition. And Liberty Kafka does not yet support that. Its most recent release, it just went 1.0, and it gained some features in the producer that laid the groundwork for EOS support, but it's not there yet, so no, sir. Sad but true. Uh, although it's not sad to use Java. It's happy to use Java. Anyway, there are other things. There's a, 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 there are several Node.js options. The main one, if you're a Node person, is maintained by Blizzard, the video game company. Um, there are, I think, at least five Ruby options. Uh, you know, if you want a library, there's a library. All right, consumers are, are harder. Consumers are more interesting. Let's talk about this. So, if I've got partitions, and I usually do, and I've got an application, that consumer, that's my client software that's using this consumer library to read messages, and I got three partitions, well, messages from all three of those partitions are going to land in me as a consumer. Now, consumers are a single-threaded proposition. It's very important. Uh, but I'm still going to get messages from all three uh, partitions. And the ordering of messages between partitions is not defined. The ordering of messages within a partition strictly guaranteed. So I will always get things in the order that they were produced in a partition landing in that consumer. But that one consumer right now is going to get messages from all three partitions, which makes sense. That's hardly a bad thing. This just means I'm consuming the topic. And I can be a single instance. doesn't matter how many partitions there are. I can, I can consume all that stuff. Consume, in this case, means read. It does not mean destroy. This is the second extremely important decision in Kafka that has far-reaching implications. The first one was that messages are immutable. All right? The second one is reading doesn't destroy messages. That means I can have as many consumers as I like. So when you put data in a topic, you usually put it, you're usually thinking of a pipeline when you design a topic, right? Here's, I'm making stuff here, and I want to use it here. And I want it to go through the pipe. Um, and that's, that's kind of where it begins. It's point to point. But once the data lives here, and if I allow that data to persist there, well, I, as many readers as anyone can imagine, can now grow up around that topic. Think of it as extremely fertile soil in which all kinds of interesting plants might bloom. Uh, other people can write their own services that consume that data. So you don't know to what sort of interesting uses that data might be put. You just know that you're putting it in a topic, and anybody can write a consumer on that data and do their own computation and expose their own API and, and you know, expose that data to other parts of the system in, in whatever way is appropriate. Uh, so the fact that we can have many readers, and that this is a log and not a queue, that's, that's why I make that, that distinction, uh, this is a key feature that can help enable evolutionary architectures. There's lots of other stuff that has to happen uh, for you to be really good at that, but as data infrastructure, uh, this is a big deal. More about that later. So another thing about these uh, dang topics is maybe one consumer is not enough. Maybe that consumer has grown some hair as an application, and it takes more time to process messages. <clears throat> maybe the rate at which messages are being produced has increased because of increased use of the system or, or whatever reason it is. Uh, and that one consumer now takes too long to consume a message. Well, that's OK. I can just add another one. So that's the same application image. Let's say I'm building an Uber jar and 
putting it in a container because I'm cool. I just have to spin up another container with that same Uber jar in it. And Kafka says, oh, well, I see your application ID. You're consumer A. Uh, I'm going to start giving you some partitions from this topic so you have work to do. That happens automatically. You have to do nothing to enable that. And it doesn't have to be fancy deployment on consumers. You can go you know, spin up a new Raspberry Pi, or whatever, whatever it is. It doesn't matter. This client, there's another instance of this client running. The cluster will begin to assign it partitions. Until you're out of partitions. So for this topic, I can scale up to three. If that's not good enough, if I have some really computationally expensive operation I'm doing and I need more consumers, I need to add partitions. And you could do that live, uh, that, but it usually is difficult. Um, some people will say, well, you know, if, if we have to change a topic, we won't. We're going to consider topics to be immutable. We'll make a new topic with the right number of partitions, move the data over, and do the, the zero downtime deploy dance uh, with the new uh, set of consumers. That's all doable. Um, or you could, you could do it live also. You can administratively increase the number of partitions in a topic. It just is. What's that? The old ones stay where they are. So the consumers are so confused. Um, keys used to be, you know, uh, uh, the, the Tim key used to be produced to partition two. Uh, but now uh, with the new number of partitions, it gets produced to partition six. And that's assigned to a different consumer. So, you know, I, I type a command and increase the number of partitions. And that starts happening. My consumers are blissfully unaware. So if they're doing anything at all stateful with the messages, that was a painful transition. Um, and there, there will be bad things that happen with the results. And in general, if the consumers do anything stateful, this back and forth, you get this elastic scalability, which you could absolutely do in and out. Um, and if you've got any state, if you remember anything about the last message, the cluster does not help you move that state. That's on you. Uh, and that's, that's a bummer. That's another kind of distributed systems infrastructure problem that you're suddenly solving. And it's fun. You talk to your friends about it at the next jug meeting, because it is actually cool code to write. But then you get caught doing it. Right? <laughs> You're like, oh, that's why I didn't get any stories done. Question back there. Got it. So the question is, if I, if I repartition this topic to more partitions, is, does that by itself cause there to be more load on consumer B? And consumer B is more efficient. It's doing less. It's able to handle all the, the load. And just by virtue of there being more partitions, there isn't, there isn't any um, meaningful change in its load. There's probably a, a non-zero coefficient on that in the consumer somewhere but it's a very small coefficient. So in general, you can think of, of the consumer's load as being independent of the number of partitions. It depends on the, number, the rate of messages. That's the important thing. Load on the brokers go up because why? Uh, yeah, yeah, totally, totally. And it, there's, yeah, totally, it's not free because there's, there's things you're doing, right? Also, um, and I'm going to say this once and move on because it's, it's a, uh, out of scope detail. At the broker level, there's a maximum number of partitions that a broker is comfortable handling. And in current versions of Kafka, it's about 20,000. A broker can handle about 20,000 partitions. Um, and that's actually not due to file handles. That's due to uh, partition leader election during failover. So you can go higher than that, but you start to see failover just kind of take an unacceptably long amount of time. So current versions of Kafka, that's, that's what limits you. Uh, active discussion on how to change it to make that infinite, it'll get there. All right, so consumers, client application. They read messages from topics. They're scalable. If they're stateful, the scaling story is a bit of a bummer. We're going to have to fix that. And all the same languages as producers. 
So we have something that writes, or it scales, writes, and reads, and remembers events forever, which is cool. But if you wanted to go build something with this, and that's all you knew, patterns would emerge. And there's, there's frameworks that you'd be tempted to extract, right? Um, let's just think about that. So out in your, you're building stuff on Kafka, you're writing microservices, and they're all talking and passing events, and this is supposed to be black, nobody panic. Um, and there's this legacy database. It's got data in it out there that you'd like to be able to get into one of your services, and you want to be able to consume it. Now, you can just go query the database, but you're like, wow, this thing is just this reactive service that's living on Kafka. I want to keep all the data in Kafka. That's valuable for various reasons. So I'm just going to write a producer that pulls that table and produces to the topic, right? You do that. It's easy. It takes you an afternoon. Uh, you tell yourself, it takes you an afternoon. It doesn't really. Um, and then you do it again a few weeks later. It's a different table, it's a slightly different situation. You also need to get updates in addition to inserts, so you enhance it a little bit. That's okay. So, you know, a couple weeks later, there's another table. You're like, hey, wait, I just keep copying and pasting this code. I'm going to write a framework, right? This is a fun chance to write a framework. And this is, again, the kind of thing that is a real temptation because there's no business stakeholder telling you to make it stupid. You can make it good. And all the weird special case code that creeps in there because the dang product manager wants something to do something it doesn't happen, right? It's the, always the temptation with extracting frameworks when you're writing business software. However, what do we know? Um, we know it's a trap uh, because that's not differentiated value, you know, code that brings differentiated value. That's, that's plumbing, that's infrastructure, that's not stuff that takes care of customers. So eventually you get busted for doing that. And even if you get a little bit of time and permission to do it, you never get enough, right? There's always a feature, there's always a bug, it's never quite there because there's pressure to do stuff that, that the business wants. You wanted the framework, the business wants features, the business is gonna win. So that example that I gave of the database thing is exactly what this thing solves, Kafka Connect. This is a cool thing that if you look at the history of Kafka, um, it, it builds out important functionality and the community realizes it needs this thing. And that thing gets done by the community in an official way. So there are people who have written their own connects. All right? It's a bad life choice. But now there's an official connect. Uh, people need to manage schemas. People write their own schema registries. Bad life choice. There is a schema registry that's open and free to use. Um, it goes on. So anyway, Kafka Connect is if you've got this central Kafka integrating with all these systems, uh, it's not that you're integrating with things that's a problem, that's fine. It's those integrations. Those are not valuable. All those systems around the edges, those do things specific to the business that customers or users care about. The red lines there, the red arrows, nobody cares about those. It's just pipes. They need to get done. And that's what Connect does. So Connect is, uh, it's two things. On the one hand, it's an actual server process. So it's, it's a program that you run on a machine external to the cluster. And it produces or consumes, depending on whether it's a source or a sync connector. Right? Each one of those connectors then talks to some external system. I'll source from uh, Postgres. I'll sync into Elastic. And you don't have to write those integrations. So connect is this, and connect is also this giant library of connectors. This is a website called hub.confluent.io. This is the Connect Hub. Confluent runs, and it's got all the connectors we know about. Many of them are open source. Some of them are proprietary, built by third parties, and the license is listed on all of them. So um, you could just go there and see, here are these connectors. A connector, just to spoil it for you, is a jar. And if you don't have the integration there that you want, the API is really pretty friendly. It's, it's, not, it's not horrible. Um, you can write your own, and then that jar, you drop it onto a connect server, and there's a REST endpoint. You throw a little piece of JSON at the REST endpoint on the connect server, and it starts running. And it keeps running. And you can scale it, and nodes in the cluster can fail, and workers fail over to nodes, that, you know, all that kind of distributed stuff that you would expect it to do. You don't have to write any of that. It's, it's a simple framework 
but it gets that integration job done. All right, that's connect. Now, what else might we do? Um, sometimes in my job, I get to talk to customers, and I'll get in a room with, you know, it's a bank, a bunch of enterprise architects, and it's exciting because you never know what they're going to throw at you, right? Like, who, what, what are the problems here that they're trying to solve that, you know, you're like, Struggling to get the problem into your head and figuring out, can our stuff do that? Um, and it's, 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 it's exciting. It's always a fun day. Um, and when you talk to companies like that are existing, that are existing users of Kafka, you say, okay, what do you do on read? Think of the applications that you have that are consuming. What do those do? Well, um, those do a few things. Uh, they'll do things like, okay, we have this topic, and it's got, it's got uh, change data captured data from some table that's got like users in it or something like that, right? And we've got this change data capture thing. Every time that database changes, we produce a message into this topic with the user record and the user ID. So that is an example of a topic where only the most recent one counts. I don't care about the history. Uh, and there's a special way you can set that topic up called a compacted topic where effectively keys are unique and the last one wins. Uh, so suppose you have that. You get this topic of user data. It's not an unusual thing. You might want to read that into memory and make a table out of it, right? Like here's make this hash table where the key is the user ID and the value is my, my user record. That's a thing people do in their consumers. Um, and then they take some other event stream that has a user ID in it and they'll look up that user record in the table and enrich that event and dump it out to a new topic, right? That happens. People enrich streams. Aggregations, I think this is most of life. Group by something, run reducing function across group after window expires. Bob is your uncle, right? That's, Bob's not your uncle though, because that's actually a pain if all you have is the consumer API. If all you have is just, here's a key value pair, it's all on you. The windowing, the grouping, the, the cute little framework for dropping a lambda in and running that aggregate, aggregate, aggregator across the group. That's all code you have to write, right? Uh, stream, stream joins, all the, and all these are stateful things. We have to scale them. That's inconvenient. Well, all of this is what Kafka Streams does. So Kafka Streams is a Java API that takes those consumers and adds all of this functionality. It's a framework for, to add all this functionality into those consumers. Um, it is a functional API, so instead of this imperative thing where you say, hey, give me messages from the orders topic, and a message shows up, and I step through it, and then I get another one, and I step through it. Kafka Streams, I say, hey, give me a, 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 a wrapper around this topic. Let's call it a stream. And now that stream has an API. I want to filter it so that I ignore all transactions of less than $5. All right, here's a lambda to implement that filtering. That now returns a new stream that's filtered. Okay, that I want to group by key. That's a method I call group by key. Oh, cool, now I have this group thing. And I want to find the max every five seconds of the, the max transaction every five seconds. Cool, uh, define the window, that's a method call. Pass in the lambda uh, for the max function. Uh, that's another method call. So I've got like six method calls maybe there total uh, in this nice functional fluent API. I don't know what's going on with state. That's all handled for me. All the grouping, hash table stuff, it's all done. It's in the framework. So functional Java API gives you abstractions for streams and tables, which are the, the two things that we deal with. And I mentioned all of, uh, all of the state management that consumer API doesn't give you when you're scaling up and scaling back, streams does. So streams has an embedded state store inside your application that actually replicates or persists back to an uh, uh, internal Kafka topic. So all of the state that you might possibly make in your stream processing is durable. So your node can go away and fail over to another node and the state fails with it. Or you can scale out and your partition gets taken away from you and move to this, state moves with it. 
Those are Streams applications. The other neat opinion here that Streams has, this is super important, is it is just a library. It's like the consumer and the producer. It's a, it's a Maven dependency and it gets built. It, it and its dependencies come along with you and they are there in your application. So you, this application, I don't know, say it's some spring boot thing with a web front end and a rest endpoint and things. Also, it's a stream processor now. So you don't deploy your stream processing program to some other cluster that has its own rigid deployment opinions. Uh, this is just a Java application. And whether your deployments are space age and awesome or they are shameful and you will not talk about them at a meeting like this, it doesn't matter. However you deploy your code, it's just Java code. And uh, the stream stuff lives in there. Now, that stream processing um, makes the processor warmer, makes the CPU warmer, right? It's work that has to get done. But it's okay because you already know how to scale these things. It's a consumer group and it scales like a consumer group, like an enhanced consumer group that knows how to scale state. Any questions about that? I feel like I should take a drink of water. I, 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 this, I'm at the point where I feel like there's questions and just they haven't quite made it out yet. What is a consumer group? Um, that's that thing that I was talking about where you have multiple instances of a consumer. That's a consumer group. Uh, so the cluster is aware that they're all the same application and it will balance partitions of a topic among the instances of that group. Dirty secret, a single consumer is also a consumer group. Uh, just a group of one. The cluster doesn't know the difference. Uh, and there's a configuration parameter. The, the, you know, what you'd think of as the application ID for the consumer. In the, the consumer API, that's called group ID. So even if you're a group of one, you have a group ID. If you're a streams application, it's called application ID, just because we want you to think. Uh, but yeah. Other questions? I'm coming. Yes. Yeah, the question is, stream, the Streams API would handle real-time transactions? 100%. Yes. So um, all of this is message at a time type stuff, which is not to say that you can't write a Streams application or can't build a cluster that has crappy latency. Like you might have a really tight latency requirement. You can mess that up, but architecturally, um, the Streams application is always trying to consume the latest message. Uh, you've got some stream processing topology set up that filters and groups and um, aggregates and joins to a table and whatever does all this stuff. Every time a message arrives, that application wakes up and does all those computations. Uh, so there's never a, a situation where you'll wait for there to be enough messages to be interesting and then do some work. It's always message at a time. Is there never a rollback? So you can, the, a rollback in Kafka means I deployed a version of my consumer that did something wrong. And so I fix that and I need to recompute some results. So then I can, I can seek to a previous offset and begin the computations there. Uh, so consumers are capable of seeking to wherever in a topic. So they can go back to a point in time. There is more to the rollback story than that in general. So it's not like, you know, you said begin transaction and you lived life for three days and then you said, uh, uh, you know, un undo that, uh, roll that back. It's not quite like that, but the data is there and I can always go back and redo things. Yes. Keys selected so that data is distributed equally. Um, the keys are hashed. That helps, right? 
um, the output of the hash function is uniform. Otherwise, it's a pretty crappy hash function. However, if you have like a power law distribution in your keys, if there's two keys that are 90% of your volume, and then the other million keys are the other 10%, that's a bummer, and you'll have to manage that. So that gets you into uh, balancing the way partitions are assigned among brokers. You can do that. There are command line commands for saying, I want this partition to go there and this partition to go here. So you find your hot spots and you move that stuff around. If you've got some super non-uniform distribution of keys, you'll have to do that. Um, and of course, there are commercial products that do that automatically. Um, that's, that's achievable. Um, that's configurable in the connect configuration. Generally, the primary key of the table is what you want, but uh, you have options. Yes. Um, you don't, I mean, I, I, at least I haven't seen anybody doing multi-version concurrency control with Kafka. I want to get, if I could get to the third act here where we start building that kind of functionality, um, the question might have a better place to land. I'll, I'll have an example of a thing where we're turning a topic into a table and maybe we can get there. Um, The thing is that writes are always these atomic produces of immutable objects. And reads are, you know, reads of those things. And you can have an in-memory representation. You can make a table out of a topic in memory. Um, the consistency question is, is, am I caught up? Not Yeah, which you never, I haven't heard of anybody doing that. Yeah. yeah. So we'll come, come back to that when we got that stuff up at the end. Okay, last part of the platform. This is super cool. Uh, sometimes, like if you're writing microservices in Java, you want uh, an API that gives you stream processing superpowers inside your application. That's Kafka Streams. Sometimes there's stream processing you want to do that doesn't really have any association to a program. It's just... I want this aggregation to happen. I want this, uh, I want to strip out PII from this topic and put it in this other topic so that everybody has access to. You know, that's, that's not, it's not tied to any application. KSQL is awesome for stuff like this. It's a SQL looking stream processing language. And it has the same table and stream abstractions. So this query, I mean, it looks just like SQL. It's selecting from a table or rather a stream of movie ratings. So this is this continuously updating topic with real-time movie ratings getting dumped into it. And we join that to a lookup table of movies and we group by movie name and then we can compute an aggregation across that group. It's just like what you do in SQL, but one of these things is not a table, it's a topic, it's a stream. And this query will create a new output topic called movie ratings, every time a movie comes in and an average changes, then we emit that new average into that output topic. So this is continuously consuming from the input and producing to the output. Every time we get a new message, we output a message. It looks like that. KSQL does run, on, you know, it needs to execute somewhere, so um, there is a KSQL server, it's just a JVM process. Uh, and this is, again, free, just clone this repo and go build it if you want. Uh, deploy that image to a server and it consumes from a topic. That's the input, that ratings topic, and then produces to some output. And once the output's in a topic, well, do what you want with it, right? You can write a consumer, you can write another KSQL query, you can write a streams application, you can Kafka connect it to somewhere. It's just there. 
And the funky thing about these queries is that they never stop. And it's, it's upsetting the first time you run a select at the command line and it doesn't return. Because that's, that's broken in database land, right? That means you're missing an index or something is profoundly wrong. But streaming queries are continuous queries. They, they, they never stop. There's always potentially another message. So they just go forever. There are these programs that run inside the cluster. And let you in on a little secret, they are Kafka Streams applications. That's KSQL is an antler grammar on top of Kafka Streams. Yes? Totally. So the question is, um, I, I don't want to keep all this data forever. What do I do? Uh, every topic has its own retention policy set on it, and so you define an, a, the sensible way to do it is an amount of time. And you don't want data forever, typically. Um, maybe you want it for a year, maybe you want it for 90 days. Your system is doing something, and you know how long it needs to last for. And you set that, and then once, you know, there are log segments that are older than that time, those fall off the edge of the world and the, the stuff that's within the retention policy lives. Topic, yeah, which is fine. Uh, it's totally okay if, if for some reason my output topic has a longer retention policy than my input. Um, that, that even seems potentially reasonable. Uh, that's fine. That just means the source data is not there anymore, but I've already produced the result, and I have the result, and it's valid data, and it has its own lifetime, and we manage that separately. So if I drop the first, so give me that scenario again. Oh. The other, the other thing you've got is you've got this right. Um, if it, it's going to depend on what my window is uh, over which I'm aggregating. If I'm aggregating over all time, then I'll just have a running average. If I'm aggregating over a four-month period and I've only got three months' worth of data in my input topic at any time, then effectively I'm aggregating over a three-month period. It's not going to break. Um, it's, it's just not going to be the, the, the window I thought it was going to be. But Kafka is going to be fine. It's going to be like, okay, this is what I have. I'm, I'm doing my window. And four months is a super big window. <laughs> yes? Let me. Yes. Is that effectively what the source topics retention times are doing? No. So Windows. A window in a case equal the question is, is the source topics retention policy effectively the window of the aggregation? And the window of the aggregation, I didn't show it here, but it's an explicit part of the grammar in case equal. Retention is totally separate. Uh, retention could, could bump up if you have a very short retention and a long window. They could collide, um, and you'd end up not having the window you thought you had. But window is a separate thing. Yes. Can you do joins across topics? 100%. That's a stream stream join, and it works. That's also always a windowed activity because of, of, of memory. <laughs> um, the records for the topics have to be kept in memory, so uh, that's a, a stream stream join is done within a window. But yes, that's a real thing. You can join a stream to a table, a stream to a stream, and a table to a table. That's in KSQL and Kafka streams. They're equivalent there. So again, KSQL is the thing for declarative stream processing, where instead of writing Java code, you're saying, here, let me declare what this looks like in the SQL-like language. And you do all those usual suspect operations, filter, join, aggregate, window. You guys are warmed up with questions. And I am going so over. 
It's okay. 15 more minutes and we're going to be done, folks. All right. Let's get back to this topic. How do I get acid properties at scale with Kafka? And why did I start by asking what a database is? Well, durability, let's address that. I think that is trivially satisfied by Kafka. Partitions are, are written to disk and replicated. So done. Okay. It's, yes, it's durable. Not an interesting question. A couple years ago, there was this Hacker News thread, because we had written a blog post that was something like, yes, it's okay to store data in Kafka. And my boss made me go read the comments and respond. Otherwise, I would not have done that, because life is short. But um, some people just can't believe this. Like, what if you set the retention period wrong? Then it won't be, well, yeah, that's, that's true. You know? What if you sudo rm-rf root? You know, that's bad too. Uh, there's all kinds of bad things. Um, anyway, it, it's durable, so that it satisfies that. But let's talk about atomicity. So this was our situation. We had to deal with the, fat, the, 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 the scenario where one of our sinks fails. And we don't want to take on a bunch of responsibility in here because it's not our job. Uh, not that we don't want to take responsibility for things, but literally, it's not our job. So what do we do? Hey. Look at that. A topic has showed up. I don't think anybody is surprised. At least I hope you're not. What we do now is instead of doing all three writes, I do one atomic produce. I, I, I get my event. I do my computation. I produce the results of that computation to a topic as a message. That operation is atomic. Uh, I've got my sinks down here. What are these arrows? Oh, so many things I couldn't hear. If you said a Kafka Connect connector, you're probably correct. They don't have to be. You could do consumers of your own, but you probably want that to be connect, right? The thing is there, use it. So what's going to happen here is when I produce new messages, connect is going to read them. Now, um, it's eventually consistent, right? That write happens, and then at some further latency, connect uh, propagates the write to the sinks. And that's, that's, that's a property of the system. We're going to have to be OK with that. But here's what's cool. When I lose one of these, I keep producing messages. That application knows nothing about this. Shouldn't know anything about this. Uh, somebody should. Somebody should get search back up. This is bad. Something's broken, right? It's not like, it's not like, it's not a problem. It's just not a problem in terms of uh, the consistency of the system here. So I'll keep producing messages. Connect keeps up to date. The database, the graph engine. You know, we have partial functionality. Okay, everybody got on the job. They got search back up. And this connector remembered its offset. And it will get search caught up. And that application knows nothing. Like it, it should know nothing. It's, it's the Jon Snow of distributed transactions. Um, it's dated. That's a couple seasons ago. But anyway, um, more, than, more than a couple. There you go. Isolation. Let's talk about isolation. This gets a little more interesting. This was our scenario. We had these multiple processes, there are multiple instances of the application that are uh, both accessing this mutable update in place data store. To no one's surprise, I'm going to replace that with a topic. So what we do now is we don't just go inserting things into some table, because who are we? Right? We ask. I type in Tim in the little box to create the user and my password, and I say create my account. And what I want is for that to turn red or green, right? That's a, I'm, I'm sitting here looking at my device synchronously waiting for that result. So I press this button, and that's going to produce a request to create Tim. And it's going to have this little context of who's doing the asking. So that, that piece of context is something that we're going to have to carry through there. Uh, and hey, somebody, some other device came in on some other server and is asking for a Tim as well. Well, let's see how this works. What is this over here? This is actually uh, a stream processor. It's a streams application. At least that's the way I'd like to think of this. It's a streams application that is turning that topic into a table. So as I consume username claims or username requests, then I can actually make usernames. So I've got these three people. I've got Ale, Eva, Vic. Now there's going to be a Tim. Well, I consume that message. There's no Tim, I'll make a Tim. That's great. And by the way, I'm going to remember some of the metadata here. I'm going to remember that process context. We're just going to need that just this once. But that, this is Tim 1 in there. 
Um, and so Tim 2 will come in and be like, ah, oh, no, there's a Tim. I'm sorry, you can't do that. You fail. Now, meanwhile, back at the ranch, I'm sitting here staring at my screen. You know, I love your nice asynchronous back end. It's great. Everybody tells me I should build them. I'm not asynchronous. I'm waiting for a result. I'm synchronous. Now, some of my expectations can be reset to be asynchronous. When I place an order and it turns out that the order is out of stock, I get an email uh, sometime later. That's asynchronous. And it tells me, oh, sorry, there's been a problem with your order, right? That's fine. But most of the, my life, I'm, I need the result. So this app or the web front end or whatever it is, is going to be polling some rest endpoint on my streams app here saying, hey, by the way, did you make my Tim? Is there a Tim 1? Um, is there a Tim 2? So is there a Tim? There'll be a Tim, but this will actually be uh, not your Tim 2, but a Tim 1. And so you'll turn that box red. Sorry, that account name already exists. This person, is there a Tim? Ah, oh, yes, here's your Tim 1. That box turns green. Your account was created successfully. So uh, sometimes the question comes up, how do we bridge synchronous UI expectations with asynchronous backend? And the sad answer is that there's a little piece of polling somewhere. There's an impedance matching transformer in between the synchronous world and the asynchronous world. And that usually looks like polling. And don't sweat it. It's OK. Feels dirty to me, too. I cut my teeth writing firmware where polling was the most wicked thing you could possibly do. Kurt? I thought this would get there. Yeah. Right. Right. So I thought this would either answer it or this would be the platform for you to ask a question again. Remember that consistency uh, was this idea of there being invariance. Well, we solved that problem. We just made sure that usernames were uh, unique. And using that same throw a topic in there, put a stream processor on the end of it. We could do the same thing with account balances. Um, I don't have examples for it, just in the interest of time. But um, account uh, you know, money transfers, reporting on account balances, you could play the same game. Topic plus stream processor gets that job done. Now, reflecting for a moment on this picture of an onion and plastic rosemary. It was sometime last year I'd been using this picture, and I realized the rosemary was plastic. And I thought, where would I even get plastic rosemary? Like, if I'm going to make a picture, I can source onions. Okay, I go to Whole Foods, I get a little sprig of rosemary. Not hard. I don't know where I'd find plastic rosemary. It's so disappointing. So anyway, I'm going to recreate this picture myself at some point. But um, I want to get back to this question of a database. Five minutes, um, and, and we'll be done. Uh, I started by asking what a database is. Let's think about that. But let me just remind you of the kinds of systems that we're generally building these days with a bunch of little programs. We take a perfectly respectable monolith piece of software. We break it up into all these pieces. And we say, let's run them on separate computers over a network. That sounds like a good idea. right? That's what microservices is. And it is a good idea. It does all kinds of bad things. But let's look at what we do. So orders come into some order confirmation microservice. right? What does that do? Well, it produces them to a topic. Here's my confirmed, or my, my validated orders. What do we do with those? Well, like I said before, anything, right? It could be dozens of consumers of that data. But you know, minimum viable product, we need to send people things. So we'll write a shipping service that consumes from that and talks to the warehouse. But wait. Where is it gonna? Where is it gonna ship things to? Okay, uh, we need a user front end so I can write a user profile, and that's going to be one of these compacted topics that has entities in it. So uh, every time somebody changes their user profile, I produce that with the user ID as the key and the record as the value, and I'll make a table out of that. That'll be a K table in my streams application here. So I have a, a nice thing I can do key lookups on. So when somebody wants to load their user profile, I can say zippity doo -dah, get your profile, and you're done. Cool thing, I need users here. And this is the dark, well, one of the several dark sides of microservices. It's so easy to, to decompose things functionally. Orders, shipping, users, you know. But uh, the data doesn't just do that. Sometimes the data from here needs to be here. And that's definitely the case here. But it's OK, because this is this 
log of immutable events, I'll just make a table out of them in here. I can do that. And again, it's not free. I need memory and, and I.O. and things for that. But in terms of data integrity, I can copy that as much as I want. So this is the system that we're building. How is this like a database? The outer layer of this beautiful piece of food that tastes good in things, but not really by itself. The outer layer is an API, right? That's SQL. Let's just say it's a relational database. Uh, if you peel that layer away, what do you have? You have tables, right? Tables are super cool. They have this type system. They have indexes. They have constraints. Um, you can change them in interesting ways. Uh, that's great. Peel the tables away. And not everybody has gone this deep in a database. If you're a DBA or if you've had to act like a DBA, you get to that horrible thing underneath with pages and B trees and updated place. And, oh, it's, it's bad. It's bad. Scars from this. Peel that layer away. What do you have? You have a log. You have a log. That's where things go first. It doesn't matter what the database is. They go to a log. And then what, if you permit me to be a little bit cute about this, what the database does is it takes the events in that log and builds up these materialized views of the changes in the log. Because reading a log, I said this before, sucks. You don't want to do that. You want uh, this nice thing with a nice data model that you can read in a performant way. And so the database agrees to build up these tables, which are effectively materialized views of this sequence of mutations. That's kind of what this is. You've got these well, set of logs of sequences of events that have happened to the system, and you build up these materialized views of that data that respond to events and expose an API uh, and a data model uh, according to performance guarantees that, that, that you're willing to make of that sequence of events. So a, a microservices system is not just microservices. It's like a database that you, you turned inside out. There's this commit log, and you're building the tables. Those are your little applications. And as we've seen, doing that at scale, you actually don't have to give up transactionality in the way that we have traditionally understood it. Pretty cool. Um, in one minute, Fire, Wheel, Kafka. These are the three primary innovations of mankind. Fire, Wheel, <laughs> Kafka. It's also on the shoes. So we got the gear. Anyway, thanks, folks. <laughs>